Hey everyone, it is Irene Lyon here. I am tuning in with you, on with you today. It is, what day is it today? It's the 18th of March, 2021, the year 2021. Today the topic, and I even printed it out for effect, is healing gone bad. Spiritual bypass, plant medicine disasters, thinking you're feeling, but it's all in your head. That's what we're going to cover today. So I have some notes. Um, I will definitely answer questions related to this topic. And before we get started, I just want to preface this by saying, you know, I'm going to be talking about things like plant medicines and, and stories of people sharing with me how much they've, how much they've um, blown up their systems because of them. I'm going to be talking about the same with, say, meditation and mindfulness, breath work. I might even mention some of the work I do and how that can lead people into an area that is just really intense. Um, I might be mentioning EMDR because we have some questions about that. Um, so all of these things that I've just mentioned, I still think they are useful and helpful at a certain time point in our healing. But, and this is a big but, or and maybe, we have to make sure we have proper foundation and proper education on board and proper resources and all those things online in our toolkit, so to speak, before we begin with something that might be considered more advanced. And here's the thing right now we just started and I know I've got some of my um, SBS members in here, my smart body, smart mind members, and they know because they've started with this week. It's our first week, our first module. The first lesson isn't an education of theory. It's not a audio neurosensory exercise where I'm guiding them through their body. It's actually something called researching your resources. So the first lesson of the 12 weeks is asking people what their mostly what their external resources are so what do they need in their environment so that when they're feeling a little stressed a little agitated a little activated a little dysregulated what what do they know works for them is it you know a cup of tea is it going for a walk is it reading a book is it calling a friend? Is it watching a funny movie? Is it listening to music? Is it doing a dance? Is it getting into a hot bath? Is it essential oils? Is it yoga? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So we start with that. This is just like an FYI to those SBSMers here. That is not by mistake or by accident. We start with that so that there is a, a an implantation, if you will, of the resource that is available to you that you know works. So very important to understand that a lot of these tools that we use to help heal, they're not bad necessarily. It's just that we haven't done the groundwork to be able to handle them and cope and manage and process and integrate what might come up. And I'm going to really put a plea out to everyone new here. If you're here, you're here for a reason. This healing work isn't going away. I have seen too many accounts of folks who have tried for 10, 20, 30, 50, some people 60 years to heal their systems with all the good things we're going to be talking about today, but they've been missing this nervous system piece and it's foundational. And this isn't my invention. This is something that we now know in the science and then the research and my colleagues back this up without nervous system regulation on board, without somatic foundations and being able to connect to our body, the environment and our mind at the same time, it is very hard to do these more advanced practices. I'm going to read a quote. It's a very simple quote. I heard it when I was listening to a podcast the other day, and it was Jordan B. Peterson, who's a fellow Canadian, this clinical psychologist here in Canada, who's very controversial, but he was talking um, on a podcast with, uh, who was it? It was Tim Ferriss. Actually, we could probably find that episode and pop it up, the YouTube episode. It was really good. And within it, 
they were talking about plant medicines, specifically psilocybin, I can never say it, psilocybin, which is what we would call mushrooms, right? And in it, Peterson said, well, that kind of um, research, because they were talking about research where they're taking people with psilocybin and with folks with um, what they would call treatment resistant depression, which I don't love that term because, well, what have those people been given for treatment? Is it just general cognitive behavioral therapy? Has it just been medications and pharmaceuticals? Have they done this somatic nervous system work? I'm gonna make a grand sweeping generalization, which I have to do for a lot of these things and say that they probably haven't done deep somatic trauma healing work at this nervous system level. So let's just make that assumption. But what Peterson said, and I'm gonna to have to paraphrase it here, is he said, well, that kind of stuff should be illegal, something along that lines. And I think it shocked the interviewer a little bit. And he goes, well, listen, not everybody is meant to have a big expansive experience depending on someone's character, their psyche, they might not be ready. They might not be able to handle being blown open, right? I'm going to grab a toy. Just a second. I forgot to grab this. So some of you have seen me play with this in some of my videos. Yes, it is a toy. Yes, it is a very simple device. Um, I've been chastised for showing you guys a toy on these videos. I don't think it's such a bad idea. Um, but this is a Hoverman sphere. And this thing is very small, but it can get really, really big, like so big that I can put it around my head, right? It's huge. <laughs> and this is a good example. So let's just say someone, they know they have trouble with their body, their mind. They know they have chronic anxiety, treatment, resistant depression, maybe a chronic illness, maybe an addiction, maybe something that falls along the lines of, and they know I have this because of unhealed, untreated survival stress physiology, AKA trauma from my early childhood, from in utero, you know, you name it, all the things that I have talked about in many other videos, not gonna get into that. Um, we have lots of other resources on things that we might not think of as traumatic, but they are, we can link that here. But let's just say someone is living in this very compressed, there's no flow, there's no capacity. I talk about this in my healing trauma videos, swimming pool, beach ball analogy. If you haven't heard my swimming pool and beach ball analogy, go watch it on my healing trauma videos. Video number one gets into that. We'll pop it in the link too. You guys have lots of homework after this. So someone who has very little capacity and let's just say they go into a session that opens up their system, might be psilocybin, might be ayahuasca, um, there's many other types of medicines, iboga, gosh, maybe it is, um, something like EMDR. Maybe it is something like neurofeedback. Maybe it is something like a yoga class or a Vipassana meditation retreat or a weekend retreat where there's so much energy and people are getting their emotions out and screaming and all these things, right? You name it. There's a lot of ways that we can open up our system, but let's say this person here who's being represented in this toy um, doesn't understand how much is trapped inside of them. They don't understand that when we've had adversity in the past, if we don't actively and directively, directly work with it, that these things inside of us, are they're not in our awareness but they are in our body. They're in our somatic system. They're stored in our system as these fight, flight, freeze responses, but also within our organ systems. This is really important, you guys. It can be within our immune system, our cardiovascular system, our fascial system, the movement patterns that haven't been expressed due to past accidents, due to not being able to fight off attackers, medical professionals, you name it. And so we go into this, into this Petri dish of experimentation with something that is new to us because we desperately want to heal. We're willing to try it. We're open, but we don't know. And we haven't done the learning that you guys are getting here today and that you'll find on my videos. And so we go in and the thing works really well, but so well that the system, it just opens up like this. 
And all of a sudden, everything that that person has been storing that they don't even know they've been storing is, is floating inside their body. They're feeling so much stuff. They're feeling emotions they've never felt before. They're feeling sensations they've never felt before. They're having movement reactions they've never felt before. Their digestion is all wonky. They're like, what the F just happened? It's too much, right? And so the question is, you know, and this is what Dr. Peterson was saying. It's like some people, he said, you know, aren't meant to have this kind of opening because they don't have the capacity to deal with all of that stuff. Now, I would, I would uh, argue that and say, well, I think we actually all have the capacity to have this opening, but we certainly don't want to go from point one, zero to a hundred in a matter of one session or one weekend or five hours. Because if we don't know what we're in for, it could fracture us in the psychic way, right? It could put us into psychosis and all the other things that might come with it, or it might fracture, fracture our physiology and our hormonal biochemistry and the the blood vessels, the cardiovascular system, the autonomic nervous system that knew how to live contained and restricted like this with a very, very, very small window of tolerance that is like a thin line, all of a sudden it gets blown up. The chemicals, the heart, all of the axes that, that distribute to our organ systems is like, what did you just do? And they're going to try to put the pieces together to get back here. But if the system got so open, it's going to be really hard to bring it back together. <clears throat> and so I'm going to read a few things. And so the, the quote that I never said that I'm going to get to now that Peterson quoted, it was Jung, Carl Jung, was or is beware of unearned wisdom. So beware of unearned wisdom. So it doesn't mean that we shouldn't all be able to get to this expansive state where we're vibrating and flowing with all of this range in our physiology, right? Because if there is a real big accident, we might need to shut down. We might need to protect. We might need to go into fight, flight, freeze. But living in our world as humans, we want to be living in this easy flow way, right? We want to be able to go for a run, go for a walk. We need to do more in our body. We need to sleep at night. So we need to slow that down, right? But we want to be able to go back and forth. And so if we haven't earned, if we haven't earned that wisdom, that regulation, and we pop right to it, we're not going to know what to do with it. Another way of looking at this, I've heard of stories where folks who play the lottery, you know, like the lotto where they you get the the tickets and you try to win like millions of dollars and and I've heard I'm sure someone could back this up that when someone wins a lot of money they usually lose it and it's gone within years because they haven't earned it they don't know how to handle money expenses it becomes this this toy that they just work with and it's and before you know it it's gone right or this luxury that they haven't built up to it's not to say that we shouldn't be given gifts and that kind of thing but that's a good example that has nothing to do with healing that shows sometimes when we haven't earned the regulation we don't have that that knowledge right that know-how of what to do so what i'm going to do i'm going to read a few things that have come to me over the past few months and they're all very similar, got them here on paper. So one actually came in just the other day when I posted that I was gonna be doing this um, topic. Someone said a plant medicine ceremony, so a plant medicine ceremony almost destroyed my life and health. I've been on a five year long path to calm my nervous system and have tried, have been trying to stabilize my health. So again, right, this person did this ceremony open and now they're trying to bring it back and stabilize and so this is real stuff you guys i'm not just making this up another person posted i think this might have been on my youtube channel quite a while ago um they said i had an ayahuasca ceremony a couple of months ago and it was very intense 
And yes, this stuff opens you up to the things that you have never considered are living in your body and in your mind. And then a couple of weeks later, I started having panic attacks and I became dissociated. I'm still experiencing mental, mental problems and I cannot function. I still have some hallucinations, right? And so again, that's the same thing. Panic attacks, again, we open up that fight flight energy is impacting our cardiovascular system and it isn't knowing how to come back down to baseline, right? And hallucinations, we will have visions, we will have imageries. It's very shamanic. This is supposed to be shamanic work, but even good shamanism needs to be backed up with safety resource containment. If a person's not ready to see the images, the visions, the horrors, the dark side, right? This is the shadow self, the old deep stuff that is buried in the recesses of our body and mind. If we're not ready for what we're going to see, it can fracture us or it can play on a loop, which is what being re-triggered, um, flashbacks, et cetera, are. Okay, so I just wanted to read those two things. And then the other one, which came in more recently, it's, it's of the same nature, but someone wrote to me just the other night, um, I did some medical intuitive work. So one might say that medical intuitive work is, is the work I've done. It's very subtle. It's very, it's not big and blow up like a lot of these plant medicines, et cetera. But um, they said, I'm now feeling very off. Um, and they had said to me, they're just in terror. They're feeling all this fear. So here's the thing, guys, we actually want to get to the point where we are feeling the deep terror, where we're feeling unbelievable fear. If we know that we had terror, horror, massive levels of abuse, trauma, adversity, and we stored it inside, to heal that, we actually have to go through the process of processing those sensations, right? The tightness in the chest, the gripping of the tissue, the physiological process of the breath rate going up, the heart rate going up, the blood pressure skyrocketing, the body breaking out in a sweat, or maybe deep tears and grief. I'm just giving you some examples. Um, maybe it's disgust. Maybe we had an abuse that was disgusting and horrible. Maybe it's feeling the wretch of wanting to vomit, the smell that came through our senses and we turned it away because it was so gross. But these smells, these experiences, for us to heal them and process them and integrate them, we actually need to feel the somatic experience that connects with it. We might not have a memory, and this is what happens. These medicines, these therapies, if you want to call them that, they are very good at opening up the process. But if we don't know how to file and organize all of it, it's going to be overwhelming. So we have to be able to be with these intensities, but not fear them. I'm going to repeat that one more time. We are going to need to feel these intensities and all of their glory and all of their pain and be with them without putting ourselves into a situation where we are afraid of that, right? And someone might say, well, gosh, that seems impossible. I would not want to smell my abuser's cologne. I wouldn't want to see that accident again in my mind's eye because my child was killed. I would not want to imagine being strapped down for a medical procedure because all I wanted to do was get out of it and break free. And I say, yes, if you feel that you can't connect with that imagery and those sensations, then certainly please do not go into these intense therapies that are trying to break open your system to handle them. We have to start small, we have to start slow. Um, this is what I call neuroplastic healing sequencing. So I've done quite a few pieces on this. I'm not gonna get through all of it, but in a nutshell, a lot of these um, plant medicines, uh, even things like psychotherapy, EMDR, breath work, meditation, for example, and I'll get into that a little bit more. They are, in my opinion, on the higher end of differentiated learning and healing. They are more advanced. 
think about it this way. If you had never done math before, like arithmetic, mathematics, and you were put in a fourth year calculus class and given a, an equation to integrate or differentiate, you wouldn't know what to do. I can guarantee it. This is not something that is just intuitive in most humans. You would need to learn how to count first. You would need, how, need to learn how to add and subtract to do basic algebra, to do basic geometry. And then you start to do very simple differential equations, calculus, all these things. And then once you've got that skill in your back pocket, like it's a second language, then you do the more highly differentiated mathematical problems that an engineer would need to build bridges and, and all that kind of stuff, right? So I wanted to throw in a non physiological example to sort of prove that point that a lot of these things that folks are getting into are too highly differentiated and the, the system hasn't learned the basics of the a b three a b c's one two threes etc so the other thing i'm going to mention here let me just get my toy out of the way is um really basic stuff so this is a this is a comment that someone sent um, from a breath work video I did just a while ago. It was I think it was last week. We can post it up here. Um, so thank you to um, Violet who sent this in. Um, you said, "Wow, thanks." And basically, in this in this video, I talk about why um, if I was to say here, sit here, and I'm not, but just pretend. If I was to say, "Okay, everyone, let's just slow our breathing down." and get really calm with our breath, take a lot of easy breaths, maybe close your eyes, don't do this. But if I was to say this, um, out of the 151 people that are here, there is gonna be a certain percentage that when I ask you to slow your breath rate down, because this is gonna help regulate the nervous system, probably 50% of you, it isn't going to work. And it's not because slowing our breath rate down isn't valuable sometimes. For some people it might work, but for others, if their system doesn't have that capacity and flow, and they're like this all the time, or like this, slowing the breath rate down might actually cause more agitation, or it might make a person dip into more of what we would call the shutdown response. So there's fight, flight, that's our sympathetic protection, survival energy, and then there's freeze. I'm really, I'm really simplifying this today. And the freeze, it puts us into a conservation mode to basically handle the threat that we can no longer fight or flee from. So if we think about this slowing of the breath down, depending on a person's physiology, it might work. Depending on another person's physiology, it might make them more panicked. And depending on a person's physiology, it might put them into more shutdown. So this is why... I don't give very simple exercises for all of you 151 and now 149 people to do because A, I don't know your physiology. You have to learn, and this is what the programs are that I teach, to understand how to read and feel your physiology so that you know when you do something with me or in a practice or in a yoga class or whatever, it doesn't have to be with me, and the teacher says, slow your breath down, and you instantly start to feel agitated, maybe you don't slow your breath down. Maybe you actually go against that and you don't follow the instruction, right? Maybe you realize, you know what, I have to stand up and move a little bit because this is too overwhelming for me to force my breath to slow down. So these are the, these are the nuances of this work. And so this idea of neuroplastic healing sequencing, I did a video on it a little while ago, um, and we can pop, pop it up here. It's um, an ebook format, so five stages of neuroplastic healing. We don't start with high level mathematics. We start with the basics. So I'm going to read this comment um, before I forget. So this is from someone who watched the video around the breathing um, vlog. So she says, I've tried for years to force myself to calm down, to breathe, meditate. I haven't gotten into meditation yet. I will to heal the nervous system and PTSD. And so often I would feel more dissociation. And even though it would allow some space between me and my emotions, it ultimately led to depressed feelings and just living in a state of roboticness. 
these things need to be taught as tools, not panaceas. I agree. So this is a perfect example. So thank you, Violet, for commenting on this of someone who starts to calm their breath down. And she says it right here. It led to depressive feelings and just feeling like a state of roboticness. This is that freeze, the shutdown response, the suppression of our life force energy. That is depression. Depression we think of as a mental thing. It is physiological. It is in our cells. You rarely will see someone who is of the depressed clinical nature able to emote and make sound and get all juicy and get calm and the way I am right now. The body won't let it because it's in that physiological shutdown protection hibernation mode. But it isn't useful because the system can't live like that. Humans are not meant to live in this kind of a robotic shut down depressed state. Why do we end up like this? It's because this stuff is new to us. We're learning now, right? This is why you're here. We're learning that we can't just fl fly through life and not work at this stuff directly. So that's one example. And then the other one, and this actually is beautiful. It's the same person. This is on YouTube, so it's public. So again, Violet, this was from a video where I taught this and we can post it up. It's called uh, DYI medicine. It's a, it's a, it's a um, containment exercise actually from Eastern traditions where you contain and you hold. And the thought is that it's supposed to calm us down. Now, like I said a second ago, if I were to get all of you to slow your breath rate down, there's gonna be three different kinds of responses. It might feel good and help for real. It might slow us down to the point where we're ready to pass out and we go into that, for, that, that frozen state, or it might agitate us so much that we feel like our skin is crawling and we need to like run away and we need to get the fight flight going. So this thing that I show, which is why I'm always very hesitant to show anything wrote, is a calming mechanism. It's supposed to be, right? Where we hold, we breathe, we visualize the energy. So Violet writes, I didn't feel relieved from this. It made me feel squeezed and claustrophobic, which I have an issue with anyway. So she already knew that the claustrophobia is there. Um, she also says, this is no way a criticism, which is fine. Um, and maybe it's because I'm overweight. It isn't just as easy as I thought. Um, and so she said, I'd love to add my comments here. So thank you to this person for sharing the reality. And so I say, yeah, for some people, this isn't going to be right for them. They might need to move a little bit more. They might need to stand up and march on the spot to get the energy going. And then that will help their system. Right. So those are just a few of the examples I wanted to read because they show really quite clearly that there isn't a one size fits all, but what there is to use a math mathematical term, there is an algorithm to how we start to unpack this stuff. There is a sequencing of how we want to begin learning and connecting with our body, connecting with the environment, and connecting with our insides in a way that is slow, controlled, contained, safe, safer than what we're maybe used to, so that the system starts to trust that it's okay to feel sensations, emotions. If someone has trouble expressing anger or setting healthy boundaries or even letting gas pass, I'm being really serious, guys, if you find it hard to burp in public or pass gas in public and there's shame around that, or if we are not able to listen to our body's cues for hunger and thirst, if we hold back a tear when we watch a funny or even sad movie, I'm gonna make a very, very open statement to say, we don't want to do these highly differentiated practices yet because the system can't even handle its own biology. Um, I just talked about plant medicine a little bit. And like I said, I am not against these things. I know many folks who have gone through very intensive um, meditation, plant ceremonies. Um, someone just said LSD, um, all these things. They can work, but the conditions have to be right. The person has to be mentally ready, physically ready, emotionally ready, 
and have the environment be such that it is safe. And I have heard so many stories of these ceremonies. And when someone's like, what is a ceremony? Typically when someone does one of these um, more, we would call it indigenous native plant medicines that have been used for centuries, right? But we also have to think we're not the way we were thousands of years ago, just on the plains, in the woods, in the jungle. We have got so many more complexities. We have held in stuff for so long, right? If we think about the tribes and the cultures that dance and, sh and, and boogie and shake and sing and drum and beat their feet and they have flow in their body, they're already living like this, right? If I use this again, they have this flow. They have so much more robustness in their system. So they can take these medicines, these teas, these, you know, tobacco, whatever you want to call it. And they can journey because they know how to track what comes up. But as I said, if we have never done that, it's like way too much for the system. So a ceremony might be you with one other person. It could be a shaman. It could be a healer. Sometimes, and this is becoming more popular, which is tricky, is you're with a group of people. And often the group of people that you're with are strangers to you. And that can pose problems if you have an issue with the environment and the safety in the environment in the past not being the best, right? So Lauren asks, how do we deal with this if we have done that? Obviously building capacity and regulation, but what other guidance have you for dealing with this kind of situation? Exactly what you said. Um, it sounds a little boring. I've talked about this in the past, but we have to get educated and we have to treat this like we're learning our ABCs and one, two, threes again. Now, of course, um, maybe there is some other type of, you know, naturopathic medicine, herbal medicine, homeopathy, getting some body work, having a therapy session to help contain maybe the explosion that occurred. But at the end of the day, those are resources that will help us gain back regulation, but we have to start building back our capacity and really stitching back these pieces that have been blown apart, right? And we're too soon in the in this world where this has become really popular to really understand how well a person can restructure when the system has been blown apart. I don't have any science on that. I, I have no idea if there has been research on that. Mostly we see research that has been positive and the other stuff gets left out, right? Um, so my guidance, my suggestion is to start the basics of this work, Lauren, and don't underestimate the power of simplicity. And the other thing too, and I've spoken about this in the past, is that if we're living in a state of survival or functional freeze, if you don't know what that is, I have a video on that, we'll pop it up. Um, we don't realize how deep we are driven by looking, how, I'll say this again, when we are living in a state of survival stress and often functional freeze, we don't realize how much our system is looking for and craving more survival energy to, to bust, bust us out of that functional freeze situation. People who are addicted to adrenaline sports, for example, and this falls into addiction related behaviors too, driving cars really fast, jumping off of cliffs. I know this because I used to do that. Um, I was quite the athlete that could put my body into intense situations and there was no fear mechanism. I literally had no fear. I still have no fear when it comes to heights and driving fast, but my spidey sense knows how to protect myself a bit more. So when we're in a functional frozen, functionally frozen state, our system, it's like it's craving psychedelic experience. It's craving something to wake us up and feel our sensations and emotions. And so it can be easy to go down the path that is seductive, that is promising this massive experience that's just gonna, going to awaken us. And for some people that might work, you guys. Some people it does work. For others, it might not. 
And I say, err on the side of caution, do some baseline work first. Um, and so someone, re someone wrote here, I did LSD a number of times in my late teens and early 20s. It was good until one time I was giving a larger dose than I was ready for. And it turned into a 12 hour panic attack in which I was convinced I was going to die the whole time. It was really bad. I know it's not the same as psilocybin, but yeah, yes. I mean, these things are very similar, right? We, it doesn't have to be a specific type of medicine or chemical um, substance. It can be lots of different things. I mean, some people can drink coffee, no problem. And they're regulated. And some people who are regulated can drink coffee and it spikes their heart rate doesn't mean that coffee is bad. It just means it doesn't go well with that person, right? I'm like that with uh, green tea. Can't drink the stuff. Makes me feel gross and I feel completely off the charts. That in um, mate, can't do it. I can drink coffee and my system is fine. So again, this is where you guys have to listen to your body. You have to listen to what's good for you. And maybe you take something and you listen to it and you say, that didn't, that didn't go well, right? That didn't feel good. I'm not going to take that again. And that goes back to one of the questions that was asked to me um, by a DM on Instagram. Um, this woman who had trouble and had their, her system um, go into intense terror with this medical intuitive. Again, I'm not against medical intuitives. I use them myself. Um, but she said, I don't feel comfortable going back to her. Well, then don't go back to her. Right. There's these obligation games that we tend to play in our world of human relations. And often they can bring up our attachment wounds. Right. We don't want to disappoint. We said we would come back and now we have to have a bit of a conflict and say why we're not, you know, are we going to say why are we just going to say, you know what, not for me. Thank you. And I'll see you later. Right. That can be terrifying for some people and they'll go back into the pot of toxicity because they don't want to hurt someone's feelings, right? So can you see how this threads into so many other things? It isn't just that thing at hand. What this person said, lots of energy practices. So this could be lots of things. It could be, it could be um, Reiki, it could be bioenergetics. Um, it could be um, things where we're actually getting hooked up to machines where electrical current, I don't know if that's what you mean. Um, but it could also be chakra work, right? Kundalini awakenings, these things that bring and blast open our life force energy. We need life force energy. But again, if it has been, if it has been shut down and non-existent and we blow it up, that is a lot to deal with. Um, I still really want to find, there we go. And then the person said, and then developed a chronic illness. So this is what is what is very important to understand. This falls into that concept of spiritual bypass. So spiritual bypass is a term and, and there's, there's debate on who coined it. Um, it doesn't matter. But basically that is when we are bypassing our physical somatic body, the sensations, the feelings, all of the stuff that's happening in this vessel of ours and we're going for that ascension, right? We're going for the higher, higher spirit, God energy. We're connecting to source and there's nothing wrong with connecting to source or the, the God of the gods that we believe in, the life force energy we believe in, the Star Wars life force energy that we believe in, the energy of Gaia, of the planet, of, of the trees and the ocean. So there's this connection to this higher realm that so many of us seek and we are working on. But if we're not tethered to the 3D physicality, like hard table, ground under my feet, this is my body, these are my tears, this is my digestion, all those things, we can fracture ourselves, we can disconnect. And this is where, as this individual said, um, developed a chronic illness, if we're not connected to something called our interoception, which is the perception of our internal environment, it is very easy, it can be very easy for us to develop an illness because we're not picking up on the cues. We're not picking up on the signs of our physiology. The physiology, the biology, it talks to us in how our urine smells and how our bowel movements are, our odor, 
how our heart feels, how our energy feels, the, the, the color of our skin, our temperature regulation, um, the fatigue in our muscles. We can go through life for many, many years, decades, and not ever pick up on any of the things I just mentioned. We don't notice that our body odor might change. We don't notice when the color in our legs looks a little off. We don't notice the gas in our stomach. We might not notice our immune system feels like it's working extra hard and it's, and it's trying to heal something. These are all, believe it or not, things that when we are regulated and connected to internally, we pick up on them, right? We really can actually feel these things. If we've never felt those things before, there's a very large possibility your system is in a disconnection with your somatic self. That is not a bad thing, but it will cause us problems. And this is, you know, case in point, this individual did a lot of energy work, which is fine, again, but if it's not connected to the viscera, the body, we will, we can develop these chronic illnesses. And then they said, then eventually everything blew up psycho psychologically. And so this was this person's experience. For some people, they might bypass the body and go right into the spiritual realm, the energetic realm, and they'll have a psychotic break. Again, there's no rhyme or reason. Everyone's a little different. Everyone's genetics are a little different. Our predispositions for certain things, right? Genetics are real, but how they express is based on our environment and based on how we treat ourselves and listen. So the person asks, what now? I say, learn to listen to your body, get into this work. If you can start my course, uh, the 21 day nervous system tune up, get into the, the, you know, the, 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 the nuts and bolts, the meat and potatoes, the ABCs, one, two, threes of just getting to know this body. Here's what's interesting guys and gals to go back to the spiritual bypass thing. I think it should actually be called, I wrote in my notes the other night, somatic bypass. The reason why is we're actually bypassing the somatic system right? It's a somatic bypass. The spiritual thing is we're actually, we're overly connecting or trying to connect to the spiritual or whatever you want to call it, the energy. And we're bypassing the soma. We're bypassing the body. I never quite thought about it until I wrote this the other night. I'm like, this is actually backwards. And so the other thing that's interesting, because I do believe having a connection to greater something is important. My students have said when they connect to their somatic body and they can connect to the interoception inside and they're connected to the environment and the trees and the birds and the dirt and the earth and their, their family and the people, they become more spiritual by default. And I think that is a sign that that is baked into us. But until we have solid somatic regulation at this nervous system level and we know how to track all this stuff, we're going to be forcing something that isn't going to be as pure and as holy, if you want to even say it that way, because our system is not, it's like half there, right? We're just living from here up, which leads me to the other thing that I had on the, the poster, the last, the last point, thinking you're feeling, but it's all in your head, right? So I, healing God bad is the theme today. The first thing was spiritual bypass, um, plant medicine disasters. I started with that first. And then the third thing was thinking you're, you're feeling, but it's all in your head. And this was very common when I would work in private practice, which I no longer do. I just do online courses. But you could tell if someone was bypassing the somatic system and didn't have, they didn't have a, a, a connection to that space. When you would ask, what are you noticing? And I can't, it's hard for me to mimic it, but they would look up into their brain trying to search for an answer. Or as I wrote the other night, they'll try to recall a past experience that was very intense. Remember what I said about folks who are in a more shutdown response, they'll tend to seek out adrenaline to feel because their system is so on the low hypo arousal state. And so they'll do something that forces them to feel because their system is actually going into a survival adrenalized cortisol state. And then they can connect to their body. It's like, oh yeah, I feel my heart racing. I feel the tension in my gut, I feel the blood in my legs. 
But if we were to ask them that, just sitting, chilling out, watching a video like this, they'd be like, what do you mean? I don't feel anything. There's nothing happening. And that isn't correct. We need to have that, that subtle ability to sense our bodies, even when we're just chilling like this, right? As I've been talking, have you been feeling your bum on the chair, on the couch? Have you been hearing the things outside? Even though I'm looking into the camera, I can see in the periphery, the bamboo outside of my window is moving. There's sky, the rain has stopped. My, my cup is here with water. I can see there's 165 people. There's 34 likes. There's questions I have to get to. And I'm a little asymmetrical on my pelvis, so I should probably shift. I'm not thinking that through. This is interceptive somatic awareness and intelligence, which is what we want. But it starts with, to answer again the question, what now? Start with these basic practices, and that's what I teach. Um, so I'm going to go on here, let's see if there's anything else. So yeah, to go back to that thing, thinking that we're feeling, it's so common, right? So if you have to recall a past experience to remember how to feel your body, then chances are the system isn't tuned all the time in the present moment. And we want to tune it to the present moment, because if we don't, we're going to miss what's happening within our system. I can't, um, stress the importance of learning this interoception piece, especially for, for those of you that have chronic illnesses um, and addictions and, and mental um, troubles. Even Peter Levine, founder of Somatic Experiencing, someone who I've learned with and, and owe so much to in terms of my body of work, he has said that we cannot heal a chronic illness if we don't connect the person to their interoception, right? Because it's that disconnection that creates a system that isn't picking up on these cues of physiological stress. Lisa says, I definitely relate to that. This is in regards to the breathing. Many health professionals have told me to slow my breathing. It drives me insane. I was pleasantly, pleasantly surprised when I started the course that this wasn't the case. Yeah, you're not insane. And it's something that I think everyone here, um, we're gonna see a shift and hopefully I'm guiding this shift. We're gonna sh see a shift in people like you who are seeking out practitioners and therapists, and you might start educating your therapists and practitioners on this. If you go into a, a therapy session, if you go into a meeting, and you hear this a lot of the times, people are like, just take a breath, deep breath, close your eyes and calm down. That should be like a screw you, you know, like, no, I don't wanna do that. For some people that might work, but why are they asking you to force your physiology into a certain state? right? It's not an exercise class. So that's where you have to say, you know what, I'd like to just, I'd just like to just check out your room if you don't mind. Um, would that be okay? And if someone says, no, that's not okay, then I would probably leave that office if I were you, right? But you can start to teach your people why it's important to not tell you to take a deep breath and close your eyes. You know, it might not feel safe to do that, right? I've been in conference rooms where the instructor on stage thinks that they're being cool and all hit by doing a meditation and getting everyone to close their eyes and, and sit up straight and put their feet on the ground. What if someone's missing their two legs and you're asking the whole group to put their feet on the ground, right? You're making so many assumptions on what is in front of you. What if someone um, uh, isn't able to see even, and I know I use orienting a lot, but we can orient with our ears, with our taste, with our smell, with our senses, so how can we start to um, not put people into a more unsafe space, right? And I've seen that in these auditoriums where you can feel energy in the group and then the, the instructor asks them to do a very specific, close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, sit nice and tall, put your two feet on the ground and instantly you feel the energy in the room die. You feel part of the energy gets a little frantic and you feel another part of the energy gets uh, kind of ADD like their attention just grabs because they don't want to close their eyes. So they force themselves to close their eyes. But in that forcing, they then feel all of their survival energy and they don't know what to do with it. So for all of you who facilitate things, just take that with seriousness, let people connect with who they're sitting next to, 
right? Have them say, hello, my name is, I know things are weird right now, and we're not doing that, but how can you have them engage with their environment in a way that isn't asking their physiology to do something that it might not want to do? This comes down to safety, right? Everything I've wanted to cover today has kind of been covered. I just wanted to, you know, talk about this because we don't hear a lot of these stories. So if you're listening to this now live or you're watching the replay, if you've had a story where you've had a, me a healing gone bad, a plant medicine disaster, you realize you were spiritually or somatically bypassed for decades, or maybe you actually were like, holy cow, you're right, I don't know how to feel, let us know. Like, I think it's important for us to start talking about this stuff and to not be ashamed of it because I think more people are having these experiences than they want to let out. Um, and I think it's because there's this raw, raw mentality that meditation, mindfulness, all of this is the thing that we should start with. And while it is important, um, it isn't everything. And I will speak of meditation and mindfulness before I end today. Um, someone said, you once mentioned that when you start this work, you can feel random buzzing, twitching. Can you explain this for a second? So Sherry, um, if you haven't started with my healing trauma videos and gotten into that, definitely do. Basically, this is fight, flight, freeze. It's the somatic system and the nervous systems, nervous systems stored stress. In video number one of the healing trauma series, I talk about a swimming pool and beach ball analogy. So basically the buzzing is unresolved, unresolved stress physiology. It's, it's, and I don't know what it is. It could be a past trauma that's specific, like an accident. It could be growing up in an environment that was constantly unsafe and you wanted to say, I hate you to your parents or punch them in the face and you couldn't. And so you stored that punch and that verbiage inside and it's spinning in your body like this buzzing. It's a twitch. Think about it. If you want to punch someone in the face, I'm not saying we should do that, right? But the desire is to fight, to, to say, that's not nice or don't hurt me, right? For those of us who have been attacked and abused and we had to go into a shutdown response and all you wanted to do was poke the eyes out of your perpetrator or hit them or slash their, their throat, that is real annihilation energy in your body but we don't do it because we might've been put into a shutdown response because we realized we couldn't fight or maybe it was our parents and we're not going to punch them because if they get punched, we might get punched back. But think about it, that desire to punch, to slash, to strangle, if you hold all that inside, that's, that's what causes these twitches, right? Um, true story. I was um, at the bank yesterday opening up an account. Um, not that you needed to know that, but um, you'll see this in people the the gentleman who was lovely he was super personable you know he wanted to shake my hand but of course he couldn't um and all i could see were his eyes because he had a mask on and he had this blink and it was so distinct and you see this in a lot of people i tend to see it more in men I'm not sure why but and that is a sign of a physiological procedural memory stuck in his system. Typically it's a little tick. It's a protective response. Is it because um, he was hit as a kid and he flinched every time? Was it because he was forced to watch horror movies when he was young and he kept trying to close his eyes, but he didn't want to show his parents that he was scared? I don't know. Was he born in a war-torn country where bombs were going off and the whistles and there was this, this you know, wanting to protect, even though you didn't know where the, the the whistles were coming from. I mean, my mom talks about this. She was born in a country where there were literally, you know, things being dropped from the sky. And the, when you heard the whistle coming, you had hid under a table, right? This is in the Philippines during the Second World War. It's like these things, these buzzings, these twitchings, they are um, sherry old usually old stress responses. And it doesn't have to be abuse. It doesn't have to be a war. It could be you had lots of dental work when you were a kiddo and you, you just, you wanted them to get away from your face, but you had to sit still because they were in your mouth and your mouth was frozen, but you could tell that you wanted to get away, right? So many examples. Okay. 
So Sarah Sherry, can you ask, what does it mean when you are doing too much or just that stuff is starting to come out and, and it is expected? Um, this comes down to doing some of the work, Sherry. It's again, I wish I could tell you exactly what it is, but we need to treat this like we're learning a second language and the second language as an, as an adult, for those of us that don't have this naturally baked into our system, because we didn't have that good nurturing environment growing up. Um, we didn't have all those things that a human system needs. Um, we need to work on it now as an adult. So everyone is a little different, right? This is why it's so tough. And I can't just say, this is exactly what it is. But usually when something is too much, we shut down a bit more, or we get more agitated, or our digestion goes off, or something goes off in our physiology, or we all of a sudden are panicked and don't want to go outside of our house right? So how this stuff moves out of us is very individual. Um, and that's why I never in any of my work ask people to do big, big, crazy trauma recalls and write everything out on a piece of paper and journal everything. It's just not useful, right? We need to work with the basics, um, the basics, the basics. So someone says, do you consider freeze and collapse sh shut down to be the same? They are on the same continuum. So fight, flight, freeze, and then the system, if it realizes that it's gonna stay alive and nothing's coming to save us, we can stay agitated and in kind of that, that, that stress chemistry, high arousal situation, or our system will start to go, no one's coming, I better collapse and shut down. Um, and that's very um, indicative, obviously, to mammals and especially humans. Someone said, I opened up in a large way as a result of a Native American healing, healing flute sounds. It was traumatizing in many ways, and I've never and never have been the same since. Thanks for sharing that, Sandra. I really appreciate that. So, you know, this is, again... I mean, when I when you hear the words Native American healing flute sounds, that sounds lovely. Now I'm curious, what does that sound like? Um, and if our system isn't ready for that, we might not be prepared for it and something wrong might happen. This is why I call this healing gone bad. Sound is very powerful, right? Um, if you've ever been to an orchestra or an opera or even a choir or just music that's really big and loud but beautiful, you feel your hair stand up, right? There's a reason why opera singers can shatter glass. That's intensity. So don't underestimate sound. And a lot of people are getting into healing sound music. My husband is actually a music uh, composer. He's a composer and a percussionist and he does healing, he knows how to do healing sound work and he composes beautiful music, but he stopped doing just healing sessions with sound because even he is like, this isn't enough. It, it, if someone is already regulated, it can provide a beautiful experience of feeling lots of intensities and lots of lows. But again, if we don't have that, <clears throat> to come back to my toy, if we don't have this nice flow in the system and our system is stuck, you pierce that sound through and poof, it can just blow us apart or it can shut us down even more. So thank you for sharing that. It's not to say that we couldn't warm up and gain capacity to eventually um, do this, do this. It might, and again, titration, I haven't mentioned this, but the importance of titrating ourselves into something. So you know, you go to these ceremonies and you're like, well, I've just paid for it. It's an hour long or it's two hours long or it's a day long. I better sit here and get my money's worth when really what we might need to do is just listen to five minutes of it. But that's not often cost effective. So what do we do? We override what we're feeling and then we push past the edge. Yeah. So someone says, uh, Natasha, for me, smart body, smart mind was also too much and too triggering. And that's the case for some people. For some, it's not going to be the right thing at the very beginning. Um, as you said, the problem is it's not assisted individually and it's not that universal. Sometimes getting back to yourself can feel like someone is. So yeah, it's a group program. So when people go into it, they are aware that there is no individual support. Um, we answer questions but it is a group program and we're all learning together. Um, and for those of you that are here in SBSM, 
know that one of the things that I say over and over again, and most people don't take me seriously until they've gone through the program a few times. But when I say, if you feel that you need to pause the recording of the video, of the audio exercise within the first minute of listening to it, do that. But our education systems and the way we've been taught has taught us, oh yeah, just no, you got to get through it. You got to get this done today. And, and that doesn't help. If we can titrate the learning and just listen to a few minutes and be like, and if your system's like, I've had enough, you, you pause it, you go to your resources, you integrate that survival physiology, and then you, that's where the healing comes in. But again, it's been so tough to teach that part. Um, Cause I really mean it when I say, take your time, integrate, titrate, do the tiniest little drops, but sometimes that just doesn't satisfy our brain for wanting it to happen really quickly. So um, I do hope, um, Natasha, that you can still go in and do little tiny bits um, of the work um, because it is there for you to do it if you're a member. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Lisa asks, can undiagnosed non-epileptic seizures be the freeze response in your opinion? In other words, many blackouts that last a few seconds that you can't remember. Um, again, it's possible. Everything and anything is possible. Like, you know, of course, I'm not a medical doctor. I am not an expert in in brain uh, disorders and those sorts of things. And I've worked with people who have had what we would call non-epileptic seizures, and they've changed because there is something going on in their system that is scrambling and then the system goes into a seizure response, into this action, into this blackout. And so what is it that's causing the system to want to just shut down, short circuit, and not feel what it's feeling, right? In working with people who have severe like PMS, for example, migraine headaches, um, responses that are very autoimmune in nature where one moment they're okay and then the next day or the next moment there's this massive symptomology when you work with that you start to realize that actually their system was trying to talk to them before 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 the migraine happened the symptom happened but the person wasn't catching it this is what i mentioned quite a while ago you guys about being able to sense when the immune system is spiking, being able to sense when the blood pressure is getting a little squeezed or the blood pressure is collapsing. And this is where it takes skill to listen to the body and sense it so that we can feel it and be like, oh, I didn't realize I was starting to go into survival. I better just feel myself, stand up, have a glass of water, find a resource that will help me stay a little more regulated but if we don't catch that we go to the next level and then the next level and then before we know it, the person is in a symptomology response syndromal response and often can go into a um, seizure response so i have seen this i have worked with it um, but everyone of course is different so important to always have medical backup but also be curious and follow your gut with this work yeah, there's another person said, I too have non-seizure movements for the past seven years. My whole body shakes and jerks. So Sandra, again, this is one of those signs of these procedural behavioral um, fight flight energies that haven't been deactivated. They haven't been expressed. I cannot tell you um, how prevalent this is in our Western society. And actually, I, I'm going to read a quote that is in one of my um, trainings because I posted it last night. This is from um, someone by the name of Bob Robert Scare. He wrote the book, The Body Bears the Burden. And the book that I actually prefer is Trauma Spectrum. So if you want a good um, resource on that, Trauma Spectrum. But he wrote in The Body Bears the Burden that unfortunately for our human species, our cages are often cultural and of our own making. He also says for generations, and I would say it's more than generations, it's like thousands and thousands of years, 
we haven't deactivated our self-protective threat responses, right? And so if you go to my Instagram, you can see that I have a picture of a dog um, growling at another dog that's trying to get at him. And this is the thing, we humans have been harmed in so many ways, often at the hands of our own caregivers and parents and siblings, and yet we keep a straight face. We don't want to burn bridges. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to say no to our family. We're, we're, it's like this obligation that slowly strangles us, right? And so believe it or not, but these uncontrollable, these shaking responses aren't necessarily a neurological disease. I've worked with people who have been diagnosed with Parkinson's and a very common trait, I even asked Peter Levine about this, um, was connection to surgeries when they were infants, not infants, sorry, when they were young, when they woke up during the surgery or they were pinned down and they, they felt terror and I'm going to die and they tried to break away, but they couldn't, right? I've had more than one client who has had um, a diagnosis of Parkinson's and like clockwork, they had the exact same three actually stories of um, one had a tonsillectomy without any freezing, no anesthetic when she was 21. And the other was a younger child and he woke up during the tonsillectomy, um, both tonsillectomies. Think how many tonsillectomies were done back in the day right? And so if that desire to run and choke wasn't enabled or they were pushed down, there's a lot of fight energy in there and it can come out in this shaking response. Of course, that is one hypothesis. It's not all of them, but I have seen that enough to see a tiny pattern as had Peter when I asked him about it. Someone said, can this have physiological overlap with too much serotonin in some instances? I've always attributed a bad trip to that, but very much understanding it was also probably too much for my system. You know, I'm not, I am not um, an expert on neurotransmitters. One of the reasons why I've learned about them, so I don't, I don't know exactly about the serotonin in this instance, but what I do know is that this situation of something being too much for your system, something is getting flooded, something is not digesting, right? Something is being swung, the pendulum is swinging in one direction too far. Um, and these neurotransmitters, they come and go so quickly. So you might need to do a little more research on that. But the question is, you know, how can the system have more capacity and stabilization um, such that if you do do these medicines, the system can handle it, but everyone is super different, right? Everyone's super different. And then the other thing I will say, believe it or not, but I have, I have had experiences myself and I've heard of people who, when they get really, really into this work and they really, really embrace it, and they are fully in the human experience and connected with the environment, we start to have natural shamanic healing visions. We start to listen to what our body needs at a very cellular, energetic, and even spiritual soul level. It can happen without these additions. It is there. So just know that that's possible and to go back to that quote of for young, from Young, beware of unearned wisdom. Be very aware of going into something when we haven't earned that passage to feel that, right? There's a great interview I did with my good friend and colleague, Chris Durkies. It's called Meditation and Mindfulness 101. We'll post that. And in that conversation, we talk about how in the day, the monks, that were learning meditation, you didn't get to learn how to meditate during the first day that you were at the monastery or even the first year. It would be years, sometimes 10 years before you actually learned the higher level to go back to my mathematics example, higher calculus stuff. You had to have these certain disciplines and practices first there before you went into that realm. Someone says, what about levels of consciousness that is described by advanced esoterics as being extremely frightening from an existential perspective and not from trauma, although decades of terror might come? Well, I would wage a guess that 
if we are feeling terror in these advanced esoteric practices, it could be our own or it could be just the collective consciousness and the trauma that was created back in the day when things came to life here in the universe, right? And so there's so much in this question. And at the end of the day, when the terror comes up, just feel the terror. But again, that sounds, you know, easier said than done. We have to gain the skills so that when the terror comes up, we can handle it, we can feel it, we can sense it, whether we get there due to esoteric practices or whatever, um, it's there, whether it's ours, our ancestors, or the human collective, right? True story, the last year I've been watching some fun shows that I never got into and my husband really urged me to. One was Battlestar Galactica, the other one, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it's a Marvel show. I watched that first one, Battlestar, and there was a moment where I could tell I was experiencing something. Was it mine? Was it a past memory? Was it a past life? Was it the history of the world that I was remembering? I have no idea, right? But it triggered something. And I watched myself needing to pause the show and wait. And I just felt it, not questioning what it was, and just let my heart go. And then I continued to watch, right? And so where this stuff comes from, of course, everyone has their own view on where these things come from. But really, if we have the language of the somatic system on board and we know how to work with it, again, that's what I teach in my programs and courses and my resources and all these things that I offer on my site, we don't. We might get a better, clear picture of what it is. We might even go, yeah, that was this back then when I was in utero. Or no, this was my mother's ancestors I can see it clear as day or oh, this was some intergalactic thing that I wasn't present for, or maybe I was right. And we just go with it. There's, there's very little skepticism when we are connected to our human system. This like viscerally, the skepticism starts, to, we know what to be skeptical of and what to be cautious of, and we know what is right for us, right? This is what sovereign source energy is. I did a video, a lecture on that back in January, if you want to check that out too. Someone said, how do I feel about internal family systems? I haven't done it personally. I know a lot of my colleagues who do or who have done. And what I've also seen is that if we don't have that connection to track our, our somatic physiology, we might not know what to do with what happens internally when we are in that IFS process, right? So again, I'm not saying this stuff that I'm teaching is better than it is. It is a, it is in my opinion, an absolute necessity for living here on planet earth in current times. So someone said, so what is, what is sometime, is it what sometimes is called a healing crisis? It can be, I've talked about that a little bit in the past, but you know, we could just say it's healing. And the thing is, is we haven't taught us humans very much about what might happen when we start to heal these old things, because we don't have, we do not have an encyclopedia of all of this documented yet, right? What comes out of one person due to that car accident is going to be very different than another person that had the same car accident. One person might have a psychotic thing that com comes up and depression and anxiety. Another person might walk away from the car, same car accident and have a chronic digestive problem that flares. So again, um, the healing that occurs is healing and often what comes with it are these intense symptoms. It can be like that, right? Um, but what we want to do is we want to have enough resource and foundation I know I'm a broken record here, but we need to have enough of that on board, being able to stay connected to the here and now that allows us to navigate that tsunami wave of intense sensation, the terror that some people have been talking about, the twitches. Because if we just sit with the twitches and we don't know how to track what's happening or pull, us, pull ourselves out when we need to, we can stay stuck in a loop of twitching indefinitely. And I've worked with people who have come in and they have tried to shake themselves to get healed. And the moment they start to feel their bodies, they just go into a shaking response. That is not useful, right? If a shaking response integrates and heals something, 
it doesn't keep happening. But what occurs is this constant continuation of that, that twitch, that shake. So we have to go in and find a way to reroute that survival energy, so the fight, flight, freeze, and all the emotions and somatic experiences that stay connected with it, we have to find a way to reroute it so it actually does heal. We could say the crisis is when we're not healing. So someone says, when symptoms flare more with deep breathing, is that fight or flight? It's hard to say. It's the system being dysregulated, right? So a symptom coming up could be something releasing that's expressing it could be a toxin coming out of the body if it's a rash but if it's a chronic something and again i don't know the context it's not so important but it is something dysregulating in the body that is coming out it could be because the system has been stuck in freeze it could in shutdown and collapse it could be that the system has fight whenever there is shutdown and collapse there is always fight and flight waiting to come up and out from it you cannot have one without the other. You can have fight and flight without the freeze, but if the system is in collapse, there's definitely freeze and there's fight flight, right? So I know a lot of times there's this wanting to figure out, is it this, is it that? And I think it's important to understand it, but then we wanna go a little bit more macro and just get to know the whole system as a whole. So someone says, this, does this mean I don't have capacity? I get ma migraines from staying still and breathing. I feel comfortable when I move. Movements like gentle dance. So we could say that there is some form of dysregulation in here, Becky, if just hanging out and being calm is putting us into migraines, then that actually, and again, I'm making a generalization, probably not real calm. It's not real rest, digest, your system is heading into a bit of a, a shutdown response coupled with that fight flight. And this is how we pop what's called a syndrome. A migraine is a syndrome. It's a symptom of something that is being um, uh, trapped in the system. It's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic both happening at the same time. And then the system, it creates a symptom. It creates a headache. It creates fatigue it creates a digestive upset, right? And so movement, you, it's good to know, you need to build, there needs to be, it looks like for yourself, more activity, more sympathetic needs to come on, more flow. And then the question is, how can you start to open up that capacity? And I'm gonna say, I can't tell you exactly what to do because I don't know how that system that you have got to that position. Right, but building up the capacity is always important. We always want to build more capacity. When I'm doing intense breath work or Wim Hof, I find it uncomfortable, but uncomfortable. But I always think I should push through it. Should I? Well, what do you think? If you're feeling uncomfortable and you're having to think, should I push through it? Chances are you've got your answer right there. I did a video on um, ice bathing uh, a little while ago. We'll put that in there. I have not. I have not come across many who are big breath workers who have true regulation. I know that might get me into trouble, but it's kind of the truth. Usually what I have seen, and this is a sweeping generalization because I'm sure there are some folks who aren't there and in this camp, but usually what I feel in those individuals is a very deep agitation at the core level and they're using this very intense controlled breathing to stay contained. But in that containment is a lot of terror, a lot of what we would call global high activation. The system, for whatever reason, is in a hyper mode of alertness. And then the breath is helping them stay contained, which is probably good. It's maybe keeping them from being a psychopath from uh, hurting their, their, their spouses, their kids. But the question is, is it actually creating true regulation? I'm not so sure. There might be some cases where someone is, but if we're feeling uncomfortable and we don't even know where to go with that uncomfortableness, the first thing is the teacher hasn't taught us enough because sometimes we don't wanna push through, right? But the other thing is, Again, this is why I don't love these blanket practices that just teach us to do these certain things because it's bypassing that somatic nuance, right? We need the somatic nuance so that we can say, I don't want this. 
right? Not every single person is going to work the same way with these practices. We need to know how to say, I don't want this and feel okay of setting that boundary, or I can't do this, or I need to stop, or this feels really good. I'm going to keep going, right? This goes along with what I said about you go into an auditorium and there's a thousand people and the teacher at the front tells everybody to close their eyes and take a deep breath and ground their feet. For some people that's going to work for others. It's going to drive them crazy, but they don't know that it's driving them crazy. So they dissociate. And then for others, they'll get agitated and they'll just start looking at their phone and doing other things. Right. And it's not because they're trying to be difficult. It's that it's just not comfortable for them to do that. So someone says, what about the feeling of my body being hyper attuned and hyper aware? It's not that I'm detached from my body and sensations, but I'm over tuned. How does was how does one address this? So interestingly enough, Papa Bear, that's your name. It's the same. So it's the same sequencing. So I mentioned a little while ago when I work with my people in groups and online, we're going through what we would call neuroplastic healing sequencing. So if someone has more hyper awareness, I see that as someone who has hypo. There's something in the system that is overriding or overtuned to something. And so the question is, do we have to teach them how to be more contained perhaps, but maybe not, because that actually might feel, as I mentioned a second ago, claustrophobic, which one person said. So again, it comes back to, not working so much with this hyper attunement and hyper awareness, but going back to the one, two, threes and the ABC is that again, we teach, it might be as simple as can you just connect with the environment when you feel this hyper awareness, when you're in that hyper awareness, does your system skyrocket to a different zone to a different galaxy, right? Maybe it means if that's so intense, I have to just focus on what's right in front of me while feeling my breath. But it might be that that hyper attunement is an old pattern from when we were young, when we saw something we didn't want to see and we got stuck in that alert mode. And ever since we have been hyper attuned to the environment because of the bad stuff we saw. So you see, you guys, this is why it's, it's very difficult for me to give you exactly what to do and how to address it piecemeal. And that's because all of the potentials with humans for what has happened to them, it's, in, it's infinite. And so rather than working piecemeal with each person in a one-on-one -on -one session, it's like, okay, we know this. We know that we need to connect to the body. We know we need to be able to connect to the environment. We know we need to be able to feel the sensations in our body, the emotions in our body. We know that we need to regulate our base level of physiology what we eat, what we drink, how we see the world, how we hear the world. When we can start to reconnect these elements that are driven by our autonomic nervous system that's maybe been thrown off from that dangerous environment or that accident or whatever it might be, when we start to bring these things back together, it's like we reverse engineer the healing process. We're not trying to figure out what caused it. And sometimes we might, as we do this work, have a realization, oh my God, I just remembered X, Y, Z, right? And the body knows, the body, as Bessel van der Kolk says in his book, the body keeps the score, right? The body knows when to say no, to name another book, Gabor Maté's book. It's very smart, but if we're not connected to it and working with it, its smartness can't be expressed. So again, very similar, um, line of thinking here. What do you know about reflexology therapy? Is it good nervous system wise? Well, it depends on the person. I love reflexology. I love acupuncture. But when I was in my 20s, I remember getting some acupuncture. It did nothing for me. I had no ability to track my system when I was that young. I didn't know what I was feeling. Now when I see an acupuncturist or get some reflexology done, it's this whole world. It's like an explosion of goodness and tracking sensations and tracking my breath. So again, it can be good for us, but are we able to listen? See you guys, this is why this is so important to start with the basics. How about the daily tendency to hold the breath? Can taking a deep breath when I become aware of it fundamentally help? Or do you have other suggestions? So I have a great article, um, Rimke, uh, why taking a deep breath is counterproductive. Check that out. We'll pop it in or you can just Google it. But this comes back to 
And I posted this the other day is a quote from Moshe Feldenkrais, which I studied his work. How can we do what we want when we don't know what we do? So you now know that you have a tendency to hold your breath. So the question is, rather than changing the breath, can you just notice the breath, right? Can you notice the breath? Usually holding the breath, there is a tendency to not feel something, to not sense what is there. And so the question is, how can you just sense that that holding is happening and then track what is tensing? Why is my system tensing? What is it afraid of, right? What is it afraid of? So I haven't talked about meditation. There's not a lot to say about meditation. I'm going to be really honest. I will regard, I will send you to another resource. Mindfulness meditation, there's all sorts, right? So there's, there's Vipassana, there's, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting. My brain's a bit tired now. Um, where we just focus on a word, right? It'll come to me. There's all these different kinds of meditation. And the thing is, is there's nothing wrong with meditation, practice, mindfulness. I do it myself. I also know that if we don't, again, broken record Irene, if we don't go back to what I've been saying, if you cannot track the sensation, and when you focus on that mantra, when you focus on that word, when you focus on your breath, if you aren't aware that your system is maybe going into a bit of a freezy shutdown response, or if you're not aware that your heart is beating higher than it was before, and you're not aware of your blood pressure rising or the temperature of your body change, and you're just so focused on, I have to do 10 minutes because that was the research says, 10 minutes every day is gonna create this. Don't do that, right? It's not useful. And so there are many people that I've talked to who have tried to meditate. And a common thing I've heard is when I started to try to meditate in the way I was taught, which is just to try to clear my head, A, we cannot clear our head of thought. It's always going to come through. We'll get better at it. But these people that I've talked to have said it was like being locked in a room with an angry man screaming at me. No joke, I've had two separate clients who said the exact same verbiage. It was like being locked in a dark room with an angry man screaming at me. To me, that sounds like something very old, right? Old, probably adversity, childhood stuff, past stuff, where we have not been able to express that fight flight energy, probably maybe at the hands of a parent or a teacher or some authority figure that didn't allow us to express what we wanted to express in that instance. So I wrote a long article, it's a long read called um, why the mindful will the, when will the mindfulness bubble collapse burst? Sorry. It has the words mindfulness bubble and burst. And so I wrote this, I think maybe five years ago. I can't remember. It's been quite a few years ago. And it talks about the dangers of going into a mindfulness and meditation practice without understanding our stress physiology. If we don't understand how our physiology is reacting and acting with the environment and our mind and our, and our memories, and then we go into a very quiet practice, it is like being locked in a room with not just one angry man screaming at you, many people, women and men, right? and sirens and, and loud sledgehammers banging at us. So um, there is, is there a mindfulness bubble waiting to burst? I think it is bursting right now because I'm seeing more and more people report to us that I, that they have not had success with mindfulness meditation and then they feel terrible because they think they should. We all have the capacity to meditate and get to that higher level of calm in the brain but if there is survival stress, this is going to be my final thought of the day for this. If there is survival stress running the front of your bus, if it is running your biology, if it's running your behavior, right? If you aren't aware of that, when we try to do these more advanced practices, which meditation and mindfulness is, it's going to be very difficult to contain or we'll do it because we're good little students but we won't realize that we're actually in a state of dysregulation when we're doing said practice. And then there's no point, right? We've just wasted our time. Um, and I've talked to, and I've heard many people that I've worked with who have said, I've tried to do this. I've tried to do that. And 
Um, it just didn't work. And then when we got into the physiology in the way that, of course, I teach through my programs, everything just started to pop and change. Um, of course, being in your own source energy, listening to your body, following your impulse, not overriding, all these things. So I'm going to end. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the comments and the shares. And we've posted a lot of extra resources if you're listening to the replay. So I really hope that you have learned something or that this has solidified something that you have always known, but you've never been able to put your finger on. Do not fret. Do not despair if you've done lots of healing practices and you're still sick and unwell. This is the common story we hear from our students. So don't stop yet. If you're here and you're new, keep your, your ears perked, follow your nose, follow the things that we've posted, go to my site, learn, get started with the course, get started with the free resources. Um, and we will talk to you next time.